Hello, welcome, and a belated happy birthday to us. The world-renowned organist Thomas Trotter, musically marking the birthday of World Service on the pipe organ in Singapore's brand new performing arts centre, the Esplanade. World Service was in Singapore and quite a few other places too. On Thursday, the 19th of December, the day the station turned 70, and that performance of Happy Birthday was given as part of a spectacular 14-hour-long live broadcast from the top of Table Mountain in Cape Town, South Africa. Thursday, the 19th of December, a very special day in world broadcasting. Well, Archbishop Desmond Tutu joins me now from his back garden, I believe, way below us in Cape Town. Archbishop, can you wave and perhaps we can see you? <laughs> Is that you, that, that purple-clad figure? <laughs> Messages we've got here. I am waking up in Kampala, Uganda, helping the cat give birth before work. <laughs> Goodness. The Red FM Breakfast Show with TJ. Today we are going to be talking to BBC. They are live from Table Mountain all the way in South Africa. They're on air. Say hi. Hey, hello. Come along with us to Cairo in the north of Africa. We want to meet the most famous film director in Egypt right now. Hussein Fahmi. Although my career mainly was uh, film directing, now I moved into acting and I'm what they call the heartthrob of the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> 70 years of international broadcasting from the BBC. Well, as you can imagine, that live broadcast from Table Mountain on Thursday was one of the most ambitious and technically challenging ever attempted by the World Service. It recreated a broadcast in 1933 on what was then called the Empire Service, which came from the top of the same mountain, but it went a great deal further. Presenters Ben Dotsy Malore and Heather Payton dropped in on people around the world, joining all year swimmers in Australia, soaring over Rio de Janeiro with a group of hang gliders, and linking up with one of India's first FM radio stations, Red FM, in Mumbai. Amongst the guests you heard chuckling away in the background a moment ago was Archbishop Desmond Tutu, one of the most vocal opponents of the apartheid regime in South Africa and chairman of the post-apartheid Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He was in his garden in Cape Town when he spoke to Heather Payton and gave her an insight into a less well-publicised aspect of his past. Prayer and politics may now be his passion, but apparently once upon a time the Nobel Peace Prize winner actually played cards for money. So, Heather asked him, was it true that he'd been what they call a card sharp? <laughs> I, I, I had a wonderful friend who later became a leading journalist. I don't know that whether that is one on you guys. Um, <laughs> and, and he and I were... Uh, schoolmates and we used to travel by train from our homes to where our school was in Johannesburg and on the train we would play a form of um, card gambling call, uh, called five card and um, uh, he and I had uh, secret signals that we, we were able to pass um, between ourselves and, and and that almost always enabled us to win games and and you, you we, we we had um, small bets um, that we were playing for small stakes um, but it, they were they were very significant for us because they augmented our our lunch money uh, when we got back to school. So you seem to you seem to be telling me that you now an archbishop a senior figure in the church cheated at cards. <laughs> I'm afraid I have to say yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I without, absolutely outrageous. Without any compunction. Uh, well, I mean, that, that doesn't that prove what we've been talking about, that uh, God can use even a, a card shop? Uh, <laughs> I suppose it does, really, doesn't it? <laughs> you were also, you're also a, a golf caddy, weren't you? Yes, with this particular friend, I, I was, I was, I was, I was. Um, I, I have to say um, something of a failure uh, because on my very first encounter, I, I, I went out with 
and it is a white uh, uh, golf. Uh, so golf must. I mean, uh, he was my master. Uh, the big pass, and um, he tees off and slices his uh, uh, drive, and it goes way into the uh, tall grass. And I lose the ball, and I wasn't too popular with uh, uh, my, my my master, so uh, I, I I didn't I didn't have a, an exactly scintillating career as a caddy. So you made a better archbishop than you did a golf caddy. Sli- Sli- slightly, ask? slightly better. <laughs> Archbishop Desmond Tutu confessing all to Heather Payton on the live broadcast from Table Mountain last Thursday celebrating the 70th anniversary of the World Service. And Bob Beebman in Hong Kong faxed us asking to hear again that part of what he described as a delightful interview. My sentiments exactly, Bob. Well, one of the benefits of having a significant birthday is that it gives you an excuse to look back and take stock of what you've been up to over the years. And World Service programme makers were doing quite a bit of that last week. In a special series called This Is London, for example, five BBC correspondents delved into the archives to find out how the World Service has responded to international political and social changes over the past seven decades. The second programme in the series featured former Moscow correspondent Bridget Kendall reporting on how the challenges of the Cold War period had been met. Right from the start, we heard, there was debate over the role World Service should play. The British government agreed that World Service should be editorially independent. But there were those within the BBC, particularly dissidents who'd fled the communist regimes in Soviet bloc countries, who passionately believed in the need to undermine the Kremlin's grip on their societies. One man who did much to encourage a non-confrontational approach was the Russian service's lead commentator. На прошлой неделе в Англии происходил ежегодный съезд британской лейбористской партии. Ask any Russian over a certain age to identify that voice, and they'd probably still get it right. Anatoly Goldberg, there talking about the British Labour Party in the late 1940s. He was a household name in Russia. As late as the 1990s, I remember being approached by strangers in Russia, asking if I'd ever met their hero. He once explained who he believed he was broadcasting to. Basically, those who listen to the BBC are intellectuals in the widest sense of the word. For example, school teachers, especially in the provinces where there isn't very much to do. A colleague of mine, Alexander Levin, used to speak of the little man in Saratov, and I think he was right. And that little man in Saratov, Anatoly Goldberg argued, would be suspicious of anything that smacked of propaganda. The key was balance and truth without embellishment. And anecdotal evidence suggests the BBC did build up a considerable following, millions of listeners, even some in Soviet labour camps. Leonid Vladimirov, later a member of the BBC's Russian service, first listened in secret in a Soviet labour camp in the late 1940s. Anybody who wanted to know more or know the truth of the world affairs, including the affairs inside Russia, tried to tune in to the um, services like BBC, the Voice of America, or Radio Liberty, which are normally called in Russia the voices. To drown out the voices, the Soviet authorities began jamming them. Twiddle the knobs on your shortwave radio in the Eastern Bloc, and you might well have heard this. KGB Jazz, as it was known. The jamming depended on the political climate and on where you lived. I can remember, in the 1970s and 80s, friends rushing out of Moscow to their duchess where the shortwave signal was so much stronger, not just for the BBC, but the German-run Deutsche Welle, the Voice of America, and Radio Free Europe stations funded by the US government, the BBC had plenty of competitors. But Yiji Dean Speer, a prominent Czech dissident, who after the fall of communism became foreign minister, says the BBC was always distinctive. 
It was very high uh, professional uh, standard. It had objective information. It, its broadcasting was very important because it set the standards for, for journalism and for reporting. Yeshi Deanspear, reflecting on the role of the BBC during the Cold War. And that was from the second programme in the series This Is London, which was presented by Bridget Kendall. The role BBC played and continues to play in reporting world politics also cropped up in a special 70th anniversary edition of Talking Point on Thursday, when World Service Director Mark Byford was Robin Lustig's guest. When the conversation got around to the fact that World Service is funded by the British Foreign Office, a caller from England, Brian Elliott, had this tough question to ask our editor-in-chief. I was just uh, wondering really about editorial independence. Can the World Service really be editorially independent if it is, as we've heard, funded by taxpayers through the Foreign and Commonwealth Office? I do wonder whether you're ever likely to, to bite the hand that feeds you, if I may put it that way. Well, all right, Mark. Well, it's, it's a fair question to ask, and is one that's asked to me wherever I am in the world. You're funded by the British government, and yet you say you're editorially independent. But we have been funded... Uh, through a grant in aid for many, many years, and yet we are the most trusted broadcaster in the world with a reputation unrivaled for objectivity and independence. That comes from being part of the BBC. That's the essential thing, is that we're not a state broadcaster. We get our funding through Parliament, but we're absolutely part of the BBC through its Royal Charter. And we don't answer, in that sense, to the Foreign Office. We answer to the BBC's governors, the trustees of the public interest. And actually, in the agreement between the Foreign Office and the BBC, the first and opening part of that agreement absolutely stresses editorial independence. But do you not strength. sometimes have conversations with somebody in the British Foreign Office who says to you, we really think it would be very useful if the World Service did this, or we really think we'd like you to do a bit less of that? I can absolutely assure you, as someone who's been a journalist in the BBC for 20-odd years and editor of the World Service for four, that actually in the last four years I've had no pressure from the Foreign Office on any story to say, can you either put that higher up the agenda, can you do more on this story, please don't do that one, none at all. And in fact, if they did, I think they know what the answer would be. BBC World Service Director Mark Byford making his point, impartially of course, to Robin Lustig and listener Brian Elliott on Talking Point. And we replayed that for you on Pick of the World, where this week we've been highlighting some of last week's broadcasts celebrating 70 years of the BBC World Service. Of course, it's not just news and current affairs that we're famous for here. Drama has also featured in the World Service schedules from the outset. A fact that was celebrated in a special production recorded in front of an invited audience at London's Café Royal last weekend. Taking to the stage himself, the head of radio drama, Gordon House, introduced extracts from some of his department's many major productions, including The Importance of Being Earnest. This Oscar Wilde classic has in fact made many appearances on the World Service and always goes down well with listeners, as did the scene from the play performed for the birthday audience. Let's hear some of it again now. Adam Godley is in the role of Jack Worthing, while Patricia Routledge is Lady Bracknell. We catch up with the pair in an apartment in London's Mayfair, where Jack's potential mother-in-law has been interrogating him about his prospects, his interests, his education and his income. Now, to minor matters, are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. <laughs> Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... well, I was found. Found? 
The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. <laughs> Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. <laughs> Where did the charitable gentleman who had the first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell, I was in a handbag. A, a somewhat large, black, leather handbag with handles to it. A, an ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, has probably indeed been used for that purpose before now. But it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognised position in good society. Well, may I ask you, then, what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. <laughs> it's in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom <laughs> and form an alliance with a parcel. Good afternoon, Mr. Worthing. Patricia Routledge as Lady Bracknell and Adam Godley as Mr. Worthing in an extract from Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, performed at the Café Royal in London to celebrate the role of drama in 70 years of World Service broadcasting. But it wasn't just World Service programmes that were getting a pat on the back last week. Every successful radio station needs an audience, and our listeners got a look in on the birthday celebrations in a series which ran throughout the week called Listener's Tales. These were stories from celebrities and ordinary listeners sharing their experiences of tuning into the World Service since its inception. Faxing us from France, regular listener John Temme asked to hear again one story that was broadcast on Outlook last Monday, which he says summed up what BBC World Service means to its listeners. Hi, my name is Henry Brooks, and uh, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, USA, and I'd just like to tell you some of my memories of the BBC World Service. Just to put you all in the picture, I happen to be blind. I was born blind, and so the radio has become a special link to me in as much as I've listened to the BBC World Service ever since I was a kid of about 10 years old, back in 1952. I didn't have a radio in those days, but... I had to stay with a family who had a blind son and a blind daughter, and I fetched up against something in the living room, and this big arc of a radio, huge monstrosity, I said, what is that? And their mother said to me, that is a short wave. She said, you can hear all kinds of things on it, foreign broadcast, and you can play with it, but you can only have a half an hour a day on it, because you'll want more, she said, and you're not getting any more. So that was how I started, listening on this thing, tuning around. I just wanted to experience it all, but I couldn't because 
wasn't my set, was it? But on my 11th birthday, I got one for my birthday, a Helicrafter S38D. And then I was hooked. And it was listening every night to all the voices and all the sounds and all the squeals and rattles and clangs and bangs and pops and clicks of static. And the BBC was right there. In those days, they had a lot of actuality features, you know, like broadcasts from locations of where things happened. What I remember was a 1955 railway strike. That always stayed in my mind because I'm a bit of a railway enthusiast. The strike must have started at about 5 in the morning because it was somewhere around 10 or 11 o'clock at night with us in the U.S. And this announcer was broadcasting the last train before the strike officially began, and you could hear it slowly moving out of the station, the steam chuffing out of the stack and the coaches clearing the way. But one of the most memorable experiences I had was in 1982 when I came up with this pain in my ribs. I didn't know what it was, so they said I'm going to have to go into hospital, maybe an operation. Well, I was pretty well blown away by this. I hadn't been into a hospital since I was a kid, and that was a pretty terrifying experience. And I knew that I had to have something with me to keep my sanity up. So I dragged in with me my shortwave portable. And when we got there, I said to the nurse, I've got this roll of wire here. I said, can you throw this out the window? And she said, sure. And she said, she did. She threw the wire out the window. I was five days in hospital, and I had the World Service with me most of the time. It was just a voice of sanity, and it was a, things that I knew and things that I wanted to hear, and a kind of level of, of reassurance, perhaps, the reassuring speech of the announcers and the, the, the slow-paced modulation that sort of kept my head together. As a blind person, I feel that the radio is a valuable lifeline in as much as whatever comes through that box is what comes through my ears, and that's one of the main receptors that I've got left to be able to pick up information. There's Braille, and then there's my ears, and that's about it. And the World Service made a big difference to me just being there. It kept my head together. Blind listener Henry Brugge on the many things that World Service has meant to him over the years. And we replayed that listener's tale for John Temme, who wished World Service a happy birthday from France. Listeners' stories have also featured throughout the year on the BBC English for Africa service programme Network Africa. But the one it broadcast last week was a particularly poignant love story, which couldn't have been aired at a more appropriate time. There is this charming lady... At 70, she sounds ever so young. Her voice sends thrilling emotions down the spines of her lovers. She sounds pretty, and each passing day, she wins new lovers. She is a goddess, keeping dates with millions of lovers of different races and religions. Her lovers are always satisfied at the end of every date, and they all look forward to the next. She lives in London, in Bush House. Oh, BBC, I am one of those lovers, and I call you Mama 70. A true love story from Nelson Abila in Ondo State, Nigeria, broadcast on Network Africa on the English for Africa service. Now, we often replay you parts of programmes from that service here on Pick of the World, but last Thursday, as a central part of the celebrations for our 70th birthday, the whole world got a chance to hear a selection of the output from the BBC English for Africa service. The celebrations had all begun with a global party. It involved scores of artists and five venues, London, Mexico City, Mumbai, Dhaka and Kabul and it's to Kabul, the Afghan capital, that will go now for the last of our picks. Kylie Morris, who introduced this limb of the concert, explained why it meant so much to the country and its people to be hosting the event. Welcome to Kabul in the concert hall of Radio Afghanistan. Just over a year ago, the idea of a concert in Kabul would have been unthinkable. Music was banned by the Taliban, and musicians either fled the country or hid their instruments and found other jobs. But now the Taliban is gone and the musicians are coming home. So as well as the birthday of the BBC World Service, this concert is a celebration of the return of Afghan music and its musicians. 
and six of those musicians performed for the audience in the auditorium of Radio and TV Afghanistan, and their music, once banned at home, was heard all over the planet. Amongst those entertaining the world was Safta Kawakuli, who comes from the very heart of Afghanistan. He'd managed to play and perform even during the Taliban period, and he plays us out of pick of the world this week, accompanying himself on a long-necked lute called the dambura. After Tawakuli, ending Pick of the World for this week. Next week, I'll be introducing part one of Pick of the Year. I'll look back over 12 months of broadcasting best. So until then, goodbye and good listening. <laughs>